Good evening, everybody. Anyam Kashimnikaya Robon. Please let us begin our Dharma talk with the mantra of the universe in its purity, Om Nam, seven times. Om Nam. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, we are in the temple of nine dragons. So let me talk to you about nine dragons. The first dragon is your eyes. Your eyes grab what there is to be seen. Your eye consciousness wants to see. So your eye consciousness needs a physical eye, like a tool, to see something. The second dragon is your ears. Your ear has a hearing consciousness behind it. That's why we want to hear something. We want to hear music, we want to hear human speech, we want to hear the birds, or sometimes we want to hear just silence. The third dragon is your nose. Behind that, there's a smell consciousness. So it wants to smell something, and that's why it needs this nose to do that. We have a tongue, that's the fourth dragon. And just a little while ago, we had dinner, so the tongue dragon was eating. The fifth dragon is your skin, your touch dragon. That's why we want to touch so many surfaces and see how they respond. The first five dragons, very easy to see. It's very easy to point at what you see, hear, taste, smell and touch. The sixth dragon is more elusive. It's your conceptual thinking. This is when the word chukpi becomes attached to this object. That's what your sixth consciousness is doing. And we love to think. We love our thinking because our mind loves to have objects. If your mind has nothing to do really, it goes into weird places and weird states of mind. That's when we imagine things. So this mind wants to be very busy. We want to have thoughts. We want to give names to this world. It's one of the reasons why we feel human. And this dragon is very hungry. Our thinking is the hungriest. But this thinking dragon, the sixth one, has a brother. Is the seventh dragon. That's the discriminating consciousness. And by this discrimination, I do not just call this a chukpi, I call this a good chukpi or a bad chukpi. So the seventh dragon is the duality dragon. We love to make good and bad high and low, correct and incorrect. We feel we do not have a clear direction without them. And the biggest difference that we make in terms of Buddhism is enlightenment and samsara. We make a clear difference between them. And this is very important. Because without the seventh dragon, we couldn't distinguish between clean and dirty, healthy and poisonous. So our survival instincts are coded in the seventh dragon. So the seventh dragon is even cleverer than the sixth. So we not only have the names, we also have the relationship between these names and forms. And this relationship is what defines us. Am I a better person or a worse person than the rest of the world? Before myself, am I a good person or a bad person? In the family, are you a good husband, a good wife, a good daughter, a good son? You have that in your mind, so the seven dragon is very clever. But when this dragon has too much to eat, it becomes very judgmental. Judgments mean that we believe that good and bad are absolute. That human beings are inherently good or evil. 
that we cannot change these categories because they cannot be changed. We believe that many times. The eighth dragon, your memory, is giving you all you need from the past. This is your storehouse. The sixth dragon is giving a name to a form. The seventh dragon tells you whether it's good or bad, you or different from you. And the eighth dragon is storing everything. What is stored long-term in your memory? What is that? Whatever the seventh made into good and bad, that is stored in your eighth consciousness. Because of that, you have some sense of identification, negative or positive. So if you just see, just hear, just taste, etc., then we can become free. Why? Because you arrive to just think and just act. We call that just doing it. When that happens, then the seventh consciousness doesn't move, doesn't make good and bad. It doesn't make me or other. Then it doesn't store it in the eighth consciousness in your storehouse. Then your homework in your mind gets less and less and less. The five kinds of poisons begin to disappear. You don't make any ideas. You don't make illusions. You do not check that. You do not hold that. You do not attach or identify with that. Then we do not want stupid things. How do we know we want the wrong things? Suffering appears. Endless cycles of life and death appear. That's how we know that we do not function correctly. So we need the ninth dragon. This dragon is the biggest, the strongest, but it has no head, no wing, and no fire. It has no big belly, it has no claws, and it has no big bulging eyes. It has only one thing, the yoiju, the essence of life and death, the mind beyond good and bad. So this yoiju, no matter how much you see it as a little golden ball, is originally infinite time, infinite space. How can you put that into a dragon's mouth in a teungjon? You have to give it some form, some color. That's how this golden ball appeared, so that we could see it. We could have some idea about it. But originally, nothing like that. So the ninth dragon is the greatest of all, because it has no name, no form, no life, no death. And this no dragon controls all the other dragons. So which one do you like? Do you like any of the eight? Then you're attached to name and form and thinking. You love the ninth? Ah, oh, I thought so. But then you lose your body and mind. Kill all the dragons. Then you attain true dragon. Attached to emptiness, big problem. Attached to form, even bigger problem. So moment to moment, keep your mind clear like space, clear like a mirror. And then you see clearly, hear clearly, taste, smell, touch, think, everything clear. Then all the eight dragons serve the ninth. So your life and your death serves enlightenment, yours and that of others. And this is why we practice. Do not have any fear of any of the dragons. Fear is the worst, because then the dragon eats you. And you do not become yoiju, you become dragon shit. That's why if you chant the Heart Sutra, you hear something very interesting. Without any hindrance, there is no fear. So the Heart Sutra is the song of the ninth dragon. Never forget to chant that every day. And then you can ride the dragon to awakening. Our lives and that sometimes seem very complicated. If we return to the dragon's nest, that's our tanjon, that's the mind before thinking, then we are doing the right thing. This tantien is our wonderful gift from our Taoist forefathers. If we do correct tanjon practice, then the mind stays clear all the time. Whether we are sitting, standing, walking or lying down, whether we are speaking, silent, awake, or in a dream, then you have a rope. This rope actually tames the dragon. This rope is your huadu. If you keep your huadu very clear, you can tame the dragon. If you do not do that, your karma becomes too big and your karma can eat you. So if you feel your life is difficult, if you feel you have insurmountable difficulties and hindrances, that means you haven't practiced enough. You can ask, how is it possible that in a country which has 1500 years of Buddhist culture, this is possible? How is this possible? 
do not let's forget that the body of the traditions, the culture of the tradition can appear and disappear. Before Shila Shide, there was not so much Buddhism here. Maybe after one or two hundred years, there will not be so much Buddhism anymore. We should watch out very carefully to preserve it because we have to feed the dragon very carefully. We always feed the first eight dragons every day, every moment. How much dragon food do we give to the ninth? How much does your practicing dragon eat? Because when a situation becomes worse, when a society has a hard time, when your family is suffering, you know that the ninth dragon is the first to die. There are four kinds of karma. Individual karma, dual karma, family karma, group karma. Individual karma seems to be very easy, but it's the most difficult to clarify. If we don't ask this question, what am I? What is this? We cannot really do the job. So as we grow, we have partners, lovers, significant others, friends, enemies, so dual karma appears. So the other person comes so close that you cannot escape the feedback. Another person is so intimate with you that there is a mirror reflecting back who you are in the eyes of the other person. This is inescapable and it should be part of everybody's life for a shorter or longer time. And if it's naturally progressing like man and woman together, then it becomes family because children appear. So the third kind of karma appears, which is very strong bondage between parents and children. Some people think, oh, I finished raising my children, then I will do whatever I want. So 20 years pass, they get there, they have nothing to do. Oh, they realize raising their children was the most important part of their lives. The little birds flew out, they have houses and families on their own, my house is empty, what happened? That means we forgot the fourth kind of karma, group karma. We have to be part of a larger community than just family. And we have to find what it is that governs this group. What is the governing principle of that group? Because if you look at these four kinds of karmas, none of them are equal to the other. We have more of one and less of the other. You have hair on your head. That means you have more lay karma than those who cut their hair become sunims. That's all fine. But one day you may cut your hair, become monk or nun, and then your life changes. Then dual karma and family karma become more empty and the individual karma goes directly to the group. So which one do you really want? We can make many kinds of commitments in life, but big commitment we can make only once. Why only one? Because big commitments take time to fulfill. Therefore, we have limited time. We have to know what is important and who is important. If we believe in that, we can lead a very meaningful and helpful life. If not, we believe our lives are controlled by others. So if you feel that your life is not yours, that it doesn't have much meaning, that you are just like a little piece of machinery, then your priorities inside are not clear. So I hope you will find the ninth dragon. Then the first eight dragons are very happy. Then your life has true meaning. You know who and what is important. Then you can cultivate your individual karma, dual karma, family karma and group karma correctly. Then we can progress on the path of awakening and help all beings. So this was, I think, enough for introductory. Lots of dragon fire. And now I would like to welcome your questions. So what is the best practice? Please tell me the best practice when I, I, I can practice in my home and my place. So the first practice is bowing. Every day some bowing is necessary. It's like breaking ice. Then chanting is necessary. Chanting is like boiling the icy water. And then some sitting is necessary. That is like taking away the clouds with some good wind. But no matter how good you are at your formal practice, it's only 50%. The next 50% is to take it out into everyday life and try that. How? You perceive your situation, relationship, and function. Then see cause and effect, action and result, speech and result. The result in speech and action is originating from your thoughts and feelings. If your mind is clear, then you do not create suffering, you make very few mistakes. 
but we are not perfect. We make mistakes. Even if our results are good, they do not last too long. And we see that even if we are very clever, very independent, we cannot do this alone. And that's when we gather some wisdom and compassion. It's inevitable. We cannot avoid making mistakes. Thereby we realize imperfection, interdependence and impermanence. This is our motivation for practice again. So then you take the results back to the meditation room, you meditate and you start the cycle again every single day. This is very natural. When she reflected herself, she realized that there, there is many discrimination inside her. You want to be free from this discrimination. Once you see something good, someone good, does it have Buddha nature? Oh, you missed that. Everything has Buddha nature. It's great Mahayana teaching. Don't shy away. If you see a bad thing or a bad person, does that have Buddha nature? Now you repeat my words. Don't repeat my words. Hit my words. So you can ask, where does your question come from? Is it come from a good place or a bad place? You can do that, okay? I don't know. <laughs> don't know is very good. <laughs> you return to don't know, all discrimination disappears. All things and all beings have Buddha nature. But this Buddha nature is originally empty. So originally it doesn't exist. It's like the yoiju in the dragon's mouth. We made it just to talk about something important. If the dragon's mouth was empty, there's nothing to talk about. After many centuries of hard practice, Mahayana Buddhism appeared and created this term called Buddha nature. Why? So that practitioners, especially beginners, would not fall into emptiness. It's a little bit like Santa Claus in the West, okay? Santa Claus is very kind and puts a gift into your shoes at night. If the shoes are clean, if not clean, no gift. Your mind is clear, you become Buddha. That's wonderful. We believe that. It's a very good motivation. So we investigate further and we find originally Buddha nature does not exist. But by then we have grown into a mature practitioner. We have lots of experience. We don't need these little golden balls in our mouth. We are fine. According to you, we have to focus on our dungeons. Mm -hmm. But she tried to focus in dungeon, but she always distract. So she asked you, to, how can you focus on the dungeon? You heard this dog barking, right? This dog is a very good dog. We have two of them. We don't know whether it's the light you know, or the dark dog. We don't know that. It's a very good dog. The character is wonderful, likes people, smells something, hears something, then warns. That's why barking. But how long would it be to train that dog to do something else? It's a very good habit from the dog to bark. But if you want to train the dog to do something that it is not used to, it takes a very long time and lots of effort. So we are used to having a lot of feelings, a lot of speech, and a lot of thoughts, hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, everything up here. So to train the mind to do something else and sit and not move, that takes a long time and a lot of effort. So don't worry, your dog will be trained. Just keep practicing. How long do we spend out of 24 hours with seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, speaking, feeling. How many hours? So how much do we feed the first eight dragons? And how much do we spend with not moving mind? The mind before good and bad. So that's our training time. That's when we feed the ninth dragon. So if you look and you do the math, we spend a lot more time with our karma than with the Dharma. That's why we have three month retreats. Because then, for a whole winter or a whole summer, you feed only the ninth dragon. You only deal with your original mind, your Buddha nature. So just practice. Yeah. And then one day the balance tips. It will not be the first eight dragons chasing the ninth. But we stop chasing and then we find it. Then the ninth dragon smiles, embraces all the other eight and says, I have always been here. And that's a wonderful moment. But this complete 
don't know. You didn't say only that? That's too easy. So one more step is necessary. You can hit back. <laughs> then it becomes complete. More questions? How can she practice in ordinary life, not uh, summer retreat, not winter retreat? Every day for you is a little retreat. Morning time, little retreat. Evening time, little retreat, just like I have said before, when Bosalim asked this wonderful question. Then, between practicing time, it's life. Also, between your evening practice and your morning practice, it's another kind of practice. We call that correct sleep. If you sleep correctly, then not so many dreams. If you do not have so many dreams, you are very rested in the morning and you feel refreshed. But if you have too many dreams, then your sleep is not restful. Then you wake up tired. That's why it's important to do the evening practice as well as the morning practice. And then, little retreat and also living your life. Both are possible and both can become harmonious. But sometimes, let's say for a weekend or for 10 days, you need to unplug yourself and go for a 100% retreat. You do some maintenance. Even though you may practice very well, morning and evening, if you live a regular daily life, it's not enough. Life is very complicated. Our minds become very busy. And then you realize that if we want to keep correct quality, correct clarity, wisdom, compassion, becoming one, becoming clear, then we need some high quality maintenance. And then 10 days, one week, short. It will do a wonderful job. In Korea, there are lay sonpangs, bosal bangs. You know, when you go and practice and it's organized, I admire that very much. It's great. I lived at Hua Gyesa when Sung San Sunin was alive for six years. And we had a wonderful bus driver. He was called Ok Kisanim. That was his name. So Ok Kisanim was not just an everyday bus driver. He had a wonderful smile, a wonderful presence, and his driving was very precise. So one day, I had a little conversation with him. Before our summer kyolche, we had a short trip by bus. We came back and I told him, Ok Kisanim, I'm so sorry you cannot do this kyolche. It would be wonderful to practice with you. He says, well, I am practicing, just not in the same sonbang. Yeah. Then my eyes went wide. I said, how is this possible? I thought only Sunims can practice Kyolche in a sonbang. He says, no, no, there are sonbangs where you practice four hours a day and we are all lay people, only men or only women. I said, how can you do that? You have just 24 hours a day, you have a family and you have work. How can you do that? Then he smiles and says, well, I do three hours in the morning and one hour in the evening. And then I said, you must wake up very early. Then he says, no, no, same time as you, 3.30. And then I said, how do you do it? Is it between 4 and 7, we sit. Then from 7, we go to work. And at home, we sit one hour. We don't go to Sonpang in the evening. We have families. Then we sleep. And next day, we do the same thing over and over again. I really like bowed to him, just like that. He had all the wonderful qualities that a practitioner should have. And he had hair, he had family. So you can do this. Just organize yourselves, it's possible. He still serves as an inspiration. I really wish I could meet him and know how he's doing. He must be in his late 60s by now. And in these days, people use the meditation application. Some, sometimes the people get us some help from the, this application, but do you think so it's really helpful for us? Can but your it, mobile phone become Buddha? Mine just died. But, Meditation application, not good, not bad, okay? But it doesn't give you anything essential. It just keeps the time, plays some sound. You can connect to other people using the same application. Not good, not bad, but very, very basic. Until recently, for 2,450 years, awakening was possible without meditation application. 
last 50 years we have a lot of electronics. The last 30 years we have a lot of mobile telephones. So you have meditation application, wonderful. Just practice, okay? Uh, how to the free from that kind of bandage? Either you become a hermit or a very, on a very distant mountain, or you have to be connected to other people. If you look around, the more people we have on this earth, the more complicated systems we make. 100 years ago, we had half of this population. 200 years ago, we had about 20% of this population. We didn't need such complex systems. Now we do. And you have a choice. Either you become part of society through some complexity, which you try to keep simple personally for yourself, or you do not become part of society. And information is power. Not even knowledge, just being informed is power. The sooner, the more powerful you are. So you have to have something fast, something accurate to inform you, to keep you updated, to keep you connected. I don't think anyone can escape that. You know, when you go up the mountain, before Ango, every Sunim has a wonderful mobile telephone. During Ango, they put it away, mostly. After Ango, all these mobile telephones come out again, and they are connected again, because without that, they cannot have their next bangbu for the next kyolche. They cannot talk to their friends, they cannot talk to their supporters, they cannot maintain their temples. So this kind of connection is necessary. But uh, how to use the things effectively? When you need it, use it. When you do not need it, don't use it. You have to see how much of that is for pleasure, how much of that is for your job. And we have to cut down on just being habitually there. Like, you go to work also. How many people play games on their phones? More and more. Games, no problem. But this game mind continues nearly all the time. Do they need it? No. Do they want it? Yes. Does it give them pleasure? Yes. Does it make them forget their problems for some time? Yes. But it becomes a very strong habit. And this habit later becomes a hindrance. So do you need it? No, you don't need it. But do you have to answer uh, your husband's, your son's, your friend's calls, messages? Yes, you do, because you're connected to them by your karma. Do you have to connect to your workplace? Yes, you do, because otherwise you lose your work. So see what you need, do what you need, do not do what you do not need. And entertainment is part of it. That's okay. Just if the balance tips, your mind is, poof, it's gone. No one can pay attention when they play hours of games every day or they watch hours of movies or videos every day. Their mind becomes toast. They become very much defocused. And then their mind performance decreases. In the West, people ask me very similar questions. And I say, Look at your own mind's performance. How clear are you? How fast are you? How accurate are you? How clear are your distinctions? How clear is your memory? How is your cognition? So these are all tests and checks. And if they are in balance, if they are functioning fine, then everything's okay. But if the mind performance decreases because the mind is not clear, then something's wrong then we became somehow slaves to the designed gadgets that were supposed to help us. And exactly the opposite happens. Sometimes people ask me questions about AI, artificial intelligence. Should we be afraid? No, you should be afraid of yourselves. AI is fine as long as you can turn it off. If you create something that is autonomous in terms of energy and cognition and all the other functions depending on information and power supply, if that becomes autonomous, your problem. Because we made it. It didn't exist 30 years ago. It doesn't really exist yet. We are kind of halfway there. And if humanity goes the same way for the next 20, 30 years, we might create an AI that will wipe us out, wipe humanity off the face of the earth, based on pure logic, okay? So then, this is the kind of biggest ramification of the problem. So you create something to help you. Can you turn it off? 
Can you become independent of it? That is the question. And even the most complex AI is not a problem. The most attractive gadget is not a problem because you can put it down. You can detach from it. You can turn it off. But the moment we cannot do that, either mentally, because you are always there, or some big entity from the servers become independent in a metal body or a skin job, a skin body, then we have a very serious problem. We created something that controls us, that didn't exist before. Yet humanity was stupid enough and lazy enough and unintelligent enough to delegate all the powers to an artificial entity that will later be more clever, more powerful and more independent than we would like it to be. It will be just our fault, nothing else. So I sincerely hope that we all find the correct way to practice, that we can support our tradition here and in the West as well. And as we practice together, we help more and more people attain awakening and help this world become free from suffering. Thank you for your attention.